So let's have a look now at uh, bridges and LAN switches. So these are um, switches, but the switches that are designed for switching between shared media networks, such as the early ethernets. Um, so LAN switches, bridges, uh, this is quite an interrelated uh, description. Uh, and sometimes you'll find them used somewhat interchangeably. So imagine if you have a pair of ethernet networks that you want to, uh, to interconnect, you can put a repeater through them. So we've talked about repeaters a little bit earlier uh, in this chapter. Um, but you still have the physical length limitation for the total Ethernet uh, between us. So remember, this is talking not about twisted pair, but about coaxial cable where each node is on the, you know, the string uh, uh, of cable. So eventually you might end up with uh, a network that's too long, or it might have more than four repeaters, which is also not allowed. So alternatively, um, you can bridge together two networks. So rather than repeating all the communications, um, you bridge them. So now you have two separate uh, network segments and the bridge forwards only that traffic which needs to go to the opposite ethernet uh, across the bridge. The rest of the traffic stays uh, locally on the side uh, where it was. Um, so, or you can even do it even more uh, simplistically and actually just any frame that comes in, you repeat on the other side. But again, now you have to do the whole uh, media access control uh, piece separately. So the Destination uh, Ethernet might be busy, and so it might have to wait before it can send it, so you need to have some buffering uh, in there. Um, but again, just the simplest, you can just uh, relay that through. Um, alternatively, uh, as I said just a moment ago, we can realize that most of the traffic probably doesn't need to cross the bridge. Most of it is local traffic. Uh, so learning bridges were introduced that would look at the, uh, the destination address uh, of the frame, uh, and look at the, uh, the source addresses uh, of frames that had come from the other side of the bridge to work out which side of the bridge uh, a particular destination or a particular node was likely to be, uh, and then forward only uh, the right traffic uh, across there. So if we have uh, a bridge and we have hosts A, B, and C on one Ethernet and X, Y, and Z uh, on the second one, um, Traffic from A to C shouldn't go over the bridge. There's, there's no point sending it there. Uh, traffic from X to Z doesn't need to go over the bridge or X to Y, uh, but traffic from X to A or A to Y or C to Z or C to X does need to go over. Um, so the question is, what is the simplest algorithm that we can have uh, that will actually let us do this? And so uh, one approach is you could actually have a fixed table in the bridge. So uh, the bridge can know, okay, hosts A, B, and C are on port one, hosts X, Y, and Z are on port two. Um, this is all fine and good. This will work perfectly. Um, it's a pain in the backside to maintain because whenever a host moves or is added or removed, you have to update uh, the table on the bridge. And the reality is you don't need uh, to do it uh, that way. Uh, the bridge has all the information that it needs in order to be able to, um, uh, to determine this information. So if the bridge looks at the source address in every frame and can record to say, okay, that source is on the port on which I received uh, that frame from. So then the, uh, uh, the bridge can build that table of where each uh, device is. Uh, and so the first time uh, that a, um, a node sends a frame, uh, the bridge will learn about it. Uh, and so it will build up this information over time. Uh, you can put a timeout in there so that if a node moves, that after a while it will get uh, removed. Or if it moves from one side to the other, actually you update which port number that uh, source address is on. And this will happen quite quickly. Um, and if a bridge doesn't know where something is, well, we can just fall back to sending it on both ports. Uh, so this reduces the, uh, the number of errors. Um, uh, that you, you're going to have in terms of routing errors uh, of uh, not bridging a frame to the port where it needs to go. Because if, if we send it to both, then we know that it will get delivered. But we're trading off some bandwidth efficiency, uh, you know, some bandwidth consumption in the process of that. The real problem is if we send it to the wrong port, uh, which is why we have this kind of you know, fallback of sending it to both. Um, and so you can have multiple bridges 
uh, and this will work so long as you don't have a loop in there. If you have a loop, um, you have a problem. Uh, so again, if we look at uh, one, four, and six, uh, these three bridges uh, connecting uh, G, H, and I, in this particular case, Ethernets, um, they have a loop. So if uh, some, if a host on segment G sends a frame, um, bridge one and bridge six will go, ah, I have the route to G. So this sounds fine at this point in time. Um, if uh, bridge six repeats that uh, frame from G, uh, bridge four will also say, oh, I have uh, G uh, is available on this segment uh, and it will send it uh, and it may then also forward that on uh, to segment H, uh, which will then uh, have bridge one saying uh, G is also available here, but G was available here. Uh, and so, you know, we have a confused situation that can result in the, uh, the frames looping through uh, continuously. And loops can happen uh, for a variety of reasons. It might be, uh, you know, accidental, uh, where the network is just very large. And so no one knows the entire layout of the network and might accidentally, uh, you know, close a, um, uh, you know, an edge on a loop or you might actually put them in to provide some redundancy in the case of failure. And so this is where the distributed spanning tree algorithm comes in to solve this problem. So if we think about the, uh, the LAN as a, a graph, so each ethernet uh, is a node and the bridge connections are providing the edges. So what we want to do, uh, if we have a, a graph that has loops in it, like we had uh, back here, so there's our loop, there and then we actually have two more loops up here in fact uh, and that those two actually then make a larger loop as well um, which effectively this isn't intended to be yeah, exactly a diagram of that one uh, but again you can see we have this same kind of problem um, so what we want to do and this is what the spanning tree algorithm provides for us it can work out which edges we can remove to still have every node connected Uh, with the shortest number of hops, but with no loops. So the spanning tree spans the entire network and it is a tree rather than a cyclic graph. So Radia Perlman, uh, a digital equipment corp, uh, came up with this. Radia Perlman actually does quite a lot of interesting work in, uh, in networks. Uh, it's well worth having a look into uh, uh, her work. One of the, uh, the many, uh, you know, to some degree, unsung women uh, in the computing and IT field. So she developed the protocol uh, for spanning tree algorithm uh, that's now implemented in, uh, in many, many systems. So again, it's, it's really about working out which edges need, well, first working out where the loops are and then working out which edges uh, can and therefore uh, of those which are the best to remove to still retain the, uh, the overall connectivity at the end. Um, so as I said, it's you're effectively disabling ports uh, on bridges or on switches that are connecting multiple Ethernet uh, networks. Uh, and the algorithm is dynamic. So if you change the network topology, it will keep updating uh, the, um, uh, the list of available links that can be used and those that shouldn't be used to prevent loops. Uh, so that you can have this uh, nice resilience still from having redundancy but without it causing uh, you know, packets to run around endlessly and then consume all your bandwidth for no good reason. So let's have a look at how it works. Um, so each bridge will have a unique identifier. So we'll call them B1, B2, B3, all the way through. Um, the bridge that has the smallest ID uh, will be the root of the spanning tree. So now there's a variety of ways that they could elect who uh, will have the lowest ID. It might be that they just use the Ethernet address because remember this should be globally unique um, so that you have a deterministic uh, root node in the tree. And the root bridge will always forward frames out over all of its paths because it's the root, right? Um, it doesn't have to worry about uh, any loops. Uh, so each bridge then uh, computes what the shortest route is 
um, to the root uh, for itself and notes which of its ports is on the path. So that port is, then becomes the bridge's preferred path uh, to the root, uh, to the root node. So again, a little bit confusing. So my uh, Australian pronunciation, uh, when we talk about the route to go somewhere, R-O-U-T-E, which you might call route, um, and the root node. Uh, so apologies if uh, that's a little confusing to you. Um, right, so then the, the final step is that all the bridges uh, connected to a LAN elect amongst themselves a single designated bridge that's responsible for forwarding the frames toward the root bridge. So effectively, they um, disambiguate and uh, the word has fallen out of my head, deduplicate uh, the links uh, back to the root from each and every bridge in the network. So this means that each bridge will end up choosing the root, which is the shortest route, which means that every path back to the root node is the most efficient path uh, available. If two are equally close, the tie is broken by choosing the bridge with the smallest ID. So this is a deterministic algorithm. Um, and so each bridge, the whole point of a bridge is that they're connected to multiple lands. So if the participants in that election, uh, sorry, so each bridge participates in the election for the designated bridge uh, for that LAN, and each bridge can deterministically decide if it is the designated bridge uh, for that link. Because again, it, you know, the algorithm is deterministic, so everyone knows what the rules are for the election, uh, and it doesn't need an arbiter uh, to decide the result of the election. Each bridge can work out the result of the election and uh, behave accordingly. And then it will forward frames only over those ports for which it is the designated bridge. So that's what actually breaks uh, the loop. So let's have a look at this example. So we say that B1, so this is the lowest number, becomes the root bridge. Um, B3 and B5 are connected uh, to LAN A. Um, but B5 will end up being the designated bridge because it has a shorter path than B3, which has to go via B2. B5 and B7 are connected to LAN B, but B5 will be the designated bridge. In this case, not because there are fewer hops, but because B5 has a lower bridge number than bridge seven. So that means that we uh, have chosen to disable these two links. Uh, and likewise, we do something similar for down here. We'll get rid of bridge six uh, because whilst the, the same number of hops, um, bridge four has a lower bridge number. So we can, without any ambiguity and with complete reproducible deterministic, uh, deterministicity, um, remove those elements, uh, effectively prune those elements out of the graph that make it cyclic and leave us with um, a tree that has no loops in it. So in practice, of course, each bridge needs to discover uh, each other bridge uh, that's in there. So it will send out a configuration message uh, on each of the ports saying, I think I'm the root of the tree and my distance to the root is zero. Uh, when it receives a configuration message from, a from uh, any other bridge, it will check to see if the other bridge should actually be the root instead. Uh, and if that has a better configuration that it can use to replace its existing configuration. So if it sees a smaller ID and it thinks it's the root, it will stop being the root and say the smaller ID uh, is the root. Um, or if it sees a, um, uh, uh, a path to the root that has a shorter distance or the same distance but a, a lower bridge ID, it will elect to use that uh, instead. So in all of these cases, it will then replace the configuration that it had and the information that it had with that um, with the new one, but of course add one for its distance to the root field because it's one hop further from uh, the root than uh, whatever advertised. So in the case of a direct connection to the root, the root will be saying, oh, I'm distance zero to the root because I am the root. And its direct neighbors will go, oh, okay, I am one plus zero equals one uh, hop away from the root node. Uh, so when the bridge deduces uh, that it's no longer the root bridge, so it receives a, uh, a message with a smaller ID than itself, um, it stops 
generating the configuration messages of its own because it's no longer the root and instead just now forwards the configuration messages from all the other bridges that it receives but again adding one to the distance field to indicate what the actual uh, distance to the root is via those paths. Now if, the, uh, if a bridge receives a configuration message that makes it realize it's not the designated bridge for a particular port, the bridge will stop sending configuration messages over that port. Um, so if we follow all of these rules through, we actually end up with only the root bridge generating configuration messages and the only bridges that are forwarding those messages over other ports are the designated bridge. Uh, for each of those uh, interconnections. So again, if we look at that same network and we start uh, by turning it on, um, pardon me, all the bridges will try and claim that they're the root node. So all bridge one through bridge seven think that they're the root node. So if we now uh, look at each configuration message, uh, so it's from node X in which it thinks that it's a distance of D from the root node, which is Y. So let's have a look at bridge three to see what it will um, uh, will see. So first of all, bridge three receives a message from bridge two, where bridge two claims to be the root node. Because two is less than three, um, bridge three will go, okay, right, you're the root node, no worries. So it will now start transmitting, saying I am bridge three and I am one hop away from the root node of bridge two. And that will get sent to bridge five, but not to bridge two, because bridge two already knows it's the root. Um, bridge two, in the meantime, has received a message from bridge one and realized, ah, bridge one really is the root. So it will send, I am bridge two. I am one hop from the real, uh, from what I now think is the root at bridge one. And that will get sent to bridge three. Um, bridge five, in the meantime, has also uh, received a message from bridge one. And so it sends to bridge three saying, I am bridge five. I am one hop away from the root in bridge one. Um, bridge three, now has, having received both of those, goes, oh, okay, so bridge one is the root and records it. And it notes that both bridge two and bridge five are closer to the root node than it is. So bridge three stops sending any messages on any of its interfaces because it knows that its neighbors are both closer to the um, uh, to the um, uh, the root node. And this also then means that bridge three will not forward packets out either of its interfaces. Bridge three has deduced that it is completely redundant uh, in the communication. Until such time as the topology changes, right? Uh, and we'll stop there and continue in a moment so we don't end up with uh, too long a video.